Greetings and salutations. Uh, we recently heard that the high yield or junk bond market uh, in the United States had passed the $3 trillion mark. Uh, certainly a massive milestone. I, I couldn't be any more pleased today that we're joined by Dr. Kamal Sri Kumar. Uh, he's president of Sri Kumar Global Strategies. Uh, but he is something of a legend in, uh, in the world of high yield investing. And I think he's going to be able to walk us through a journey today. Uh, thank you so much for being, being with me. Very good to be with you, Danielle. And thank you for inviting me to this interview. So uh, start off with a little bit of your background. Uh, you, your, your accent is definitely not California, where we are today in Santa Monica. The only thing I would say to you is I'm doing a cross-country trip with my son and stopping in Rapid City, South Dakota, where I went over to a Starbucks shop and they looked at me and said, are you from California? <laughs> and you would say, what in my accent made you think that? But it was my wearing a mask, not my accent. So people <laughs> say that for different reasons. But to go back to your question, no, I was born in India mm -hmm. and came to Columbia University as a PhD student. Those were days of foreign exchange controls imposed on the Indian side. So the central bank gives you $8 worth of foreign exchange at, the, at that ex official exchange rate. You show up in New York, wait for Columbia to give you your fellowship money, waive your tuition. But to get a, but a good ending was that four years later I had my PhD mm -hmm. and my mentor Robert Mundell, who sadly passed away earlier this year, was again a great inspiration in terms of helping the finish the PhD thesis. It was good and thereafter I've been in this country. Well, I didn't know we had Columbia in, in common, but, uh, but that was certainly <clears throat> a special time in my life. I was actually at Columbia on 9-11, oh, wow. you know, coming up on the 20-year 20, 20 anniversary. Different school, getting my second master's in, in journalism because I always wanted to write when I left Wall Street and, and here I am writing and still involved with the markets. So you were, you were in a productive, uh, rich school. We like to call it, we were in the poor school. We were in a building called Fairweather, mm -hmm. if you may remember. We didn't even have a coffee machine of our own. We had to go to the business school cafeteria to get <laughs> coffee. But uh, despite that, Columbia was a lot of fun. A few years of being there. So where did you start? I started out in Citibank, which was my mm -hmm. first job. For a lot of people, it was this place. It was almost like a continuation of school. Mm -hmm. And in the 1970s, international lending was expanding. It was big. And, people, and Walter Riston, the legendary CEO of Citibank, used to say that countries do not default ever. And so we all believed in that mantra. We went in with it. And, but you had to assess the risk involved in different countries and that's how with my macro background compared with international finance and adding to it, I became a country risk analyst. Mm -hmm. And this went on for a few years. I worked at Marine Midland Bank, which doesn't exist anymore. Marine Midland, I haven't heard that in some time. Yeah, it's been a while, right? Maybe we will because the new governor of New York is from, is from Buffalo, New York, and that's where Marine Midland was headquartered. Mm -hmm. It was purchased by Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. I became then Believe it or not, with my accent and my look, I became a specialist on Latin American countries. And when I began in 1979, I didn't know the difference between Argentina and Mexico. I roughly knew where they were. <laughs> but I was told by my boss, we will have a teacher come and teach you free and teach you Spanish. And that was the attraction. Six months later, I was in Montevideo, Uruguay, having a discussion with the central bank on their monetary policy in Spanish. That's fabulous. Hablo español yo. Oh, okay. Muy bien. <laughs> I was just. Podemos continuar en español entonces. <laughs> I'm not sure how the rest of the audience would feel about that. I was prior to COVID. My most recent trip uh, prior prior to COVID was with the with with the Central Bank of Mexico. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Um, and they it certainly, is one of the better managed central banks in the region. Yes, and Cardenas has gone on to, uh, to, to continue to do good work. Yeah, uh, he's, right. at, he's at the BIS now. Uh, so uh, take us to Latin America. Take us to that, to that time. And, and also, when you switched over from City to another firm on another coast. Right. City, and I talked to you about Marine Midland, and then I've, 
this is now, we are going back to 1982. Mm -hmm. August of this, that year, the Mexican officials were uh, coming to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to say, we are bankrupt. We can't make any debt payments anymore. And Marine Midland, the way it was but countries located, don't go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, they don't go bankrupt, right? <laughs> Alfred, 140 Broadway, where we were, you can look diagonally across at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York mm -hmm. entrance and you saw this whole team of cars parked and Mexican officials whom you recognize by sight, they're all going into the building. Wow. You knew something was... So if you did a, one of those Peter Lynch type shoe leather research, you would know something is dreadfully of wrong. Of course. Uh, so, the oh, one, I, wait, one, did you say 140 Broadway? 140 Broadway. That's where I first interviewed at oh, DLJ. My <laughs> oh my God. We have a lot in common with yes. that, as well as the oh Columbia background. Yes, okay. Remember that with the bull, the raging bull oh, in good. That's right, that's right. So, it's looking at that, and six months later, it became clear to me, this is what an economist does in long-term forecasting. I said, this is not one of the short-term issues you're facing. This is going to be a long-term problem. And I said, I'm becoming a consultant. And he looked at me and said, only people who are fired become consultants. I said, yeah, I want you to stay. There's no reason Shows for Shows you how the world has changed. Yeah. You, you don't need to become a consultant. And so think about it for two weeks and come back. So I went, um, just spent five days. And I said, I don't need two weeks. I've spent five days. I'm becoming a consultant. Zero client base. But what helped was the auditing firm, which was auditing Marine Midland, I went to them and appealed to them and said, look, you are auditing different money center banks there. Then there was also other banks like JP Morgan, Chemical Bank, Manufacturers mm -hmm. Hanover. And even though you do that, you don't have an assessment of the countries and how much the assets are worth. Mm -hmm. I'm not an accountant or a financial person, but I can give you the macro background to it and you can use that essentially to show the regulators you're taking adequate care in assessing your clients' portfolios. Right. This is, this is your due diligence, your risk assessment. And it clicked and they became my first client. Started with zero, within about two months I had that. And then thereafter, another auditing firm which uh, audited the rest of the New York City Bank, they found out, well, they are hiring you as a consultant. We don't want to be left out without it. I got hired again. There was no conflict of interest. I'm mm -hmm. giving you country information. Sure. So I could do both. And then soon enough, I was auditing. I was working for three of the then big eight accounting firms. That got me started. Then I had a few regional banks who became clients. So in the first year, my total intake revenue was just $5,000. But in the second year, I was making more money than my bank job, <laughs> and it was very enjoyable. And Drexel Burnham had just started a debt trading group out of Beverly Hills. And the person who was there wanted help in also getting advice on what, what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So I started, and after the first meeting, the second time he said, can we meet a few minutes before our meeting begins? I said, sure. We met, and he said, how about closing up your shop and coming and meeting a person called Michael Milken? And I said, oh, I've heard his name. I've seen his name in newspapers. And so they said, get on a flight and come. And the rest of it is history. 1986 onward, I've been on the West Coast and had a wonderful time at Drexel Burnham. Those were the times when our CEO at that time, Fred Joseph, used to say the assets you are looking at is the, you're not looking at junk, you're looking at toxic waste when mm -hmm. you're looking at Latin America. Mm -hmm. And what we found was there were gems among them, mispriced assets. And it was a highly imperfect market. Mm -hmm. There was no Bloomberg terminal to tell you what it is worth or right. to make a one basis point different. So trading meant you made a huge difference between buy and sell. And I have interesting incidents. One of those was visiting Rio de Janeiro in 1987, mm -hmm. walking with a banker along the Copacabana. And the guy says, Sri, you know, uh, we heard that Brazil may uh, reduce interest payments next week. I had not heard it. Nobody had heard it. And it was common news in, within Rio in the banking circles. So I went back to my hotel room, urgently called Beverly Hills and said, this is what it is. 
And the next thing, we were shorting uh, Brazilian debt, and it, was, it turned out to be a victory within the next couple of weeks. So it was a very nice going, and I think Mike, with all his wisdom, decided that this was a time when you could collect together all of those assets and essentially get the people who are used to high yield investing who understand risk. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not going to the mom and pops of the world to buy them, but you are going to the sophisticated institutions. How they could come in and the whole refinancing could be done. They would get an enormous profit if the guess is correct, because you're buying at a deep discount. Right. The countries would get new financing, which they are not able to get from the banking system. The International Monetary Fund is not providing it. And so started a fund. It was actually fun uh, in 1987. Mike would talk to his clients. I would sit there giving the economic story. Again, I have no illusion that the investors came in because of my wisdom. But it was good to be doing the pairing with him so that he talks about the countries and then I can explain what the economic background was. Mm -hmm. Started a $170 million fund, which was huge during those years. Right, my gosh. 1987. Yes, yes. yes. And then uh, it grew and uh, 1990, after Drexel closed its doors, uh, TCW purchased that fund. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and that fund with a different name and a change in uh, size is still in existence. So many Remarkable. years later, you are talking about so many years later that continues to exist. TCW then uh, hired me initially because of my Latin American uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. Then it became looking at all of uh, emerging markets, including Asia. And mid 1990s, I started to chair the asset allocation committee globally. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun. We had good work there. We looked at it top down on the allocation side. We didn't do anything bottom up ourselves. We had portfolio managers who would come and tell us what they are doing in different TCW strategies. Mm -hmm. And then from a top down viewpoint, you decide whom you want to allocate how much money to. Do you like this manager? what he or she is saying, does it make sense? And you allocate it and you are judged by your investors in terms of how much you exceed uh, your benchmark, your, your performance. And when I left TCW in 2012, the last quarter, Wall Street Journal uh, rated 365 conservatively managed asset allocation funds we were called the king of those 365, so that was very nice as a going away present. Mm -hmm. So it's been fun. So yeah. when, when, when you say you were assessing countries, do you mean the world? All countries? Uh, it is only some countries which are commercially important okay. in terms of lending. and mm -hmm. in the, You're looking at two um, areas, Daniel. One is you're looking for banks which have lent money and therefore they were trying to see if they would continue to be serviced, mm -hmm. if they will pay their interest and principal payments. That's one area of interest. That's how it started because there was no long-term equity investment uh, in those countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not friendly in that area at all when you're talking about the 1980s and even into the 1990s. It changed because this is what Drexel was taking advantage of, was debt to equity conversions that you could do selectively in countries mm -hmm. that introduced the concept of equity to foreign investors, but they were going in on a discounted debt basis in order to gain entry. Mm -hmm. With the passage of time, country risk analysis took on a different tone. What I had to do was to say, what are the top-down characteristics a country should have to attract foreign direct investment? If you are following those qualities, which I want you to follow, mm -hmm. that means I, the risk of that country going downhill is limited. What would they be? I want good economic management. Economic growth should be steady and positive because economic growth in turn is a demand for more resources. Mm -hmm. And as Bob Mandel would say, if you do not provide that cash domestically, it has to come from abroad. Importing cash means 
running a surplus on your trade balance or getting capital inflows come in. So that's the second quality that you want to see. You want to look at the current account deficit in the balance of payments. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure then that the for FDI or foreign direct investments are a good proportion of the current account deficit. For example, a good country would be Brazil where FDI has been 100% or more of the current account deficit in a number of years. Mm -hmm. So why is that important? You say if you're following all of the right policies and foreign direct investments are substantial, they cannot turn tail and go away in the next six months. They are stuck for the next five years. Mm -hmm. If they are stuck for five years, they do want long-term forecasts on how it's going to be. That's the difference again, not only between Brazil and Turkey, which depended a lot on short-term capital flows, but also a difference between Brazil and Argentina. You have to make a distinction. The two stock markets are highly correlated, but then you say Brazil is better managed compared with Argentina over the years. So if I have $100 to put in, I'm going to put most of it in Brazil and very little in Argentina. That's what I said to a client with long-term interest. It turned out to be a very good. Brazil continued to prosper and the small loan to Argentina had to be written down to zero. <laughs> so that part, so in terms of what the country risk analysis does, we are looking at Brazil was important, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, again, very mm. important as well. Um, then in, you go to Moss, Russia, Irrespective of the politics, the Russian Central Bank, I call it the University of Chicago classroom. Um, uh, Elvira Nebuyelina, the president of the Central Bank, she manages interest rates like she couldn't care less. There is no political influence involved in doing it. So if you do that, you like a country for foreign direct investment. So Brazil is important. Russia is important. On the Asian side, China, of course, is huge, giant in terms of attraction. Well, but you were, you were analyzing, you were probably there kind of at the advent of the China that we know that entered the World, the World Trade Organization in 2001. It was presumably a much different market prior to its evolution to become what it is that we think of it as today. When, when did you first start kind of assessing China? Started assessing China in the mid 1990s. So okay. you're talking, you're, as you are absolutely right, the opening up took place in 1979 with mm -hmm. Deng Xiaoping. Mm -hmm. So you, let's say you've had 15, 16 years of opening take place by the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. But then when you go uh, to investors to look for money, they were still quite skeptical mm -hmm. that China can amount to anything at all. Uh, property rights were not well established. So you had to depend on economic variables and the management skill to see whether you would get paid or your foreign uh, direct investment would pay off. Mm -hmm. I remember going to one large investor and we spent two hours making a presentation, a group of us, top down, bottom up, what we are trying to say. And so when we, in the middle of it, after about an hour, when two of us left for a rest break, we go out and we say, we are going to get a lot of money with this investor. And two hours pass by and one, one person then says, uh, how much do you think you're going to invest? And the answer is, invest? Oh, I'm not going to invest anything. I'm here to see who would be so crazy as to go and make an investment in China. Uh -huh. That was the approach in the mid 90s. So we have come a long way Mm -hmm. And after 1995, after 2000, especially after the World Trade uh, Organization entry right. in 01 that you mentioned, China became the darling of foreign investors. But now I think once again, you are at a critical juncture and country risk becomes very important. Let me see, may I go over uh, why? Please, please. Here this the, is a very, very hot topic right now. Here are the reasons. You do not have country risk the way I started to study in 1980. They are not running short of foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Normally, when you look at Argentina or Brazil and there is a problem, the exchange rate 
goes kaput. They just depreciate like crazy. Not happening. And you read about these countries that, that are running low on their foreign reserves. And right. These thin cushions and how dangerous it could be. Yes. That is not happening. Or you find that in the case of Mexico in 1981, the foreign exchange reserves were close to zero. I went to the uh, deputy head of the central bank and said in Spanish very uh, nicely, how much reserves do you have? This is something the IMF used to put out. Of course. And the answer I get is, no puedo divulgar la información. I cannot disclose, I cannot the, disclose information. the information. So you know that they have nothing. <laughs> oh. So you don't have the problem with China today. The foreign exchange reserves are huge mm -hmm. and they are a creditor to the whole world. Then where does the risk come from? You have to modify your thinking. The risk comes from the fact the Communist Party is supreme and you cannot cross swords with them. And you've had companies which have had a difficulty in, in the stock market because they dared do something to show that their company was more important than the country or the Communist Party. We learned that's a no-no. So why does the country risk increase? Because there are some companies that you think are very good, but it is not going to work out if they run afoul of the senior, man senior management of the country. That is one right. issue. We this think of Jack Ma and Alibaba. And, and Jack Ma and Alibaba of or both happened. Not only that, but I was astounded. The tutoring companies, they came down. And the reason for that, Daniel, was the fact that if you are dealing with tutoring and if you run a tutoring company, only I can afford to send my child to a tutoring school. The others cannot. So my child gets into a better university, other children do not, and the class distinction gets wider, and the Communist Party is threatened. And they use the United States, by the way, as the example. Example. That we don't want to go down that path of yeah. income inequality, so the haves that, and the have-nots. Yeah, so that is the big issue. So as a foreign investor, you are led to speculate on what is it that you can allow where should you be investing and where should you keep out of? Tutoring company you would never have expected would be something they would come down on. You might have anticipated for Alibaba, what would you have anticipated for the tutoring company? Mm -hmm. They said the tutoring company should become non-profit. And of course, the founders said, I'm not going to run it as a non-profit. They gave up. So that's one element of risk. Sorry. Sure. No, no. Continue. That is one element of risk. The second is, and this is something I've been talking to my clients repeatedly, and it looked like a sleeper issue, the China debt side. When you mm -hmm. look at the amount of corporate debt and state and local company uh, mm -hmm. government debt, mm -hmm. the total, uh, by my es quick estimate, it's about 360% of GDP when you add all the un unregulated debt. Not the sovereign. It is not a problem at the central bank level, which has a lot of reserves. Right. But the question is, is the central bank going to spend all the reserves bailing out all of these people? Probably not. So if you are buying Chinese debt, and there are two companies right now which are in the forefront. One is called Evergrande, which mm -hmm. is a large property developer. Right. The other is a distressed debt investing manager called Huarong. And both of them had a, have had a lot of issues and the government has essentially said, I want you to swim or sink by yourself. The question foreign investors have to face is, is there another Lehman Brothers type issue left in the future? What does that mean? Lehman Brothers was supposed to be a small investment bank, inconsequential. Mm -hmm. And if we don't bail them out, it won't have any global consequences. We found it was wrong. Of course. And the question is, how much do they bail out and which companies do they not bail out? And if you make a mistake there, then uh, it is going to have a huge impact, not only on China, but on the global markets. So there's a second risk. It, the, was, it, you, it, it was interesting to see a few days ago that the government put out a public directive to Evergrande to clean up your act. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm saying to myself, with what? Yeah. <laughs> how how yeah. are they supposed to do this? And yet the government was public. In, in saying, you know, you've got to write your debt problems. Precisely. They canceled a special dividend, which everybody had expected. That in turn caused the rating agencies to take notice. Mm -hmm. Many of them have downgraded. 
So that, though those issues are not going to go away. They are going to stay behind. 2020 worsened the debt problem because they had to increase credit in mm -hmm. order to get the economic growth going very quickly. Right. And China's story, by the way, if we come to it later, is should be a lesson for the United States. It doesn't affect you when you're going through the expansion process. It will hit you a year, two, three years after you have done that. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is a, is a major issue. Third and final one is really panoramic the deteriorating US-China mm -hmm. relationship. And I like to say to my clients, when Donald Trump was president, the Chinese could get away saying, well, he's all alone, he's attacking us in public, nobody's going to go with him, and we are okay, we'll deal with the bombast, and nothing much will come out of it. Mm -hmm. What has happened now is you have a more serene person who deals in diplomatic talks, but yet, the relationship has worsened and none of the restrictions on the Chinese uh, has been removed. Nope. And again, China is not happy with the situation. They are planning to uh, threaten to retaliate, particularly the fact that Chinese companies which are listed in New York have to go through extra regulation. Then they'll have to disclose who the real investors are. It is, this is just a minefield that is coming up. So those are my three issues. You know, it feels like, you know, if, if you look back at, at, at history, you know, what, what can sometimes start off as a, a trade war, there, there's currency wars, there's trade wars, and eventually if the tensions rise enough, you start to talk about other forms of war. Precisely. And I, I don't know that there's, I think from, from an investor's perspective, from an outlooker's, you know, from, from somebody looking from the outside in, we tend to separate away the political from the economic. And I, I think that that's potentially problematic. Absolutely right. You're spot on. You cannot separate the two. You have to look at them together. Mm -hmm. And whether the political is more important or the economics is more important can change with time. And you need to be going with the flow in making those changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that's where I think China is today. And I like to say to investors today that you cannot go in just on a bottom-up basis. You can't say, I have a good company, I've evaluated the earnings and the management, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with it, I'm going to buy that company. Right. You have to say, will that company run afoul of the, manage, of the economic leadership in Beijing? And what will that do to the stock price? Mm -hmm. Because as we have seen, when, the, uh, when Beijing comes down on you, the stock price just collapses, Right. as we saw with the tutoring it's, companies. It's black instance. and white. There's no, there's no gray. There's no, there's no, there's no cushion right. at all. Right. Um, let, let's shift gears, since you mentioned that there, there are ramifications. And even in the United States, we've seen not just a tremendous run up of the fiscal deficit and, and U.S. debt is approaching $30 trillion. We've seen corporations continue uh, to raise record, record levels of debt. Every, every month they say, oh, you know, this is a record September we're expecting uh, for, for debt issuance. At some point, do the two become also linked in the United States? Because we don't think about it that way. If, if somebody was to say, you know, a state-operated enterprise in China, you, you could possibly conflate that debt with sovereign debt. But you would never think that of the United States. That's an excellent point. You should conflate the two. You should be looking at them together in the United States as well, because alongside the increase in the fiscal deficit and the federal debt that you spoke about, the companies have been encouraged to take on debt by the near zero interest rates that have prevailed since March of 2020. And as we understood from uh, Jerome Powell's speech in Jackson Hole, mm -hmm. that's not going to end anytime soon. Whenever he decides to end tapering, uh, you do not have a situation where interest rates are going to rise at all. And I took it from the message that he gave is interest rate increases are probably at least one year away from today. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, and you're going to feed all the increase in debt that is taking place, uh, it is something the corporations may not be able to pay at a higher interest rate, some of them. And you run the risk that the federal government's 
debt service uh, payments will have to increase with an increase in the 10-year bond yield. And that is why the succession in the Federal Reserve is critical. I have my own thoughts on what the Federal Reserve Chairman's term should be and how he or she uh, should be nominated. But we simply do not have the independence of the Fed at all in the current setup. And that is a major concern for me on the debt buildup. So what, I'm, I'm curious because I, I'm a huge advocate for term limits in Congress. And you, you've seen with some senators such as Pat Toomey that they're able to legislate much differently knowing that they're leaving. They're, they take risks that otherwise they wouldn't take if they were up for re-election. So what, what would you change about term structure, term limits at, at the Fed? I'm, I'm curious, this is my world. Uh, it is my world as well. So I, let me say I have given it a lot of thought. And the, what I would like is for the Fed chairman, who is presently named for four years, mm -hmm. and it happens midway through the presidential term. So it mm -hmm. doesn't end with the presidential, presidential election, but it ends about 15 months, uh, 16 months later. I would like that pattern to continue to provide an element of uh, separation between the president of the country and the chairman of yes. the Federal Reserve. But the point I really would like to see is for the Fed chairman to be nominated for a single six-year term. You are not re-electable. And the reason is today we have all the speculation about what will happen in the Fed. And Powell will be nominated or not nominated uh, starting February 1st, 2022. And I had thought that uh, President Biden might announce it by Jackson Hole, but that's not happening. Mm -mm. Now it's expected September, October, and we see the news report saying Treasury Secretary Yellen is all in favor of his renomination. So, for all practical purposes, it looks like he will be renominated. Mm -hmm. What's the problem here? He has to be thinking about that in terms of when. To uh, stop tape, uh, when to start tapering, and to start that's right, or increase interest rates. If I were Fed chairman, put me in that spot, and I would say, I'll take care of it after I'm renominated. Exactly. Let me get past February the first. Where is Fed independence? <laughs> Absolutely yeah. nowhere. So Fed independence is a fiction, and the only way you're going to get out of it is if you nominate me for six years and after six years I have to quit. And if that had been done with Jerome Powell, he has another two more years to go, go goes into 2024. And then he knows that he has to be worried about his legacy, how he performed in six years. Mm -hmm. And then you would be talking about a successor. If you're thinking about Lyle Brainerd as a successor, for instance, she would start also for another six year term mm -hmm. or anybody else for that matter. Sure. Uh, so that, I think, is a major issue. The second issue I have with the Fed is studying Federal Reserve history. The last time a Federal Reserve chairman was outvoted was in 1986, the early part of the year. Paul Volcker, my hero, uh, in bringing down inflation, found out that he was outvoted. And Preston Martin, the vice chairman, and a Reagan nominee had voted against him, although by the end of that day, he had pulled his vote back. But first time around, Volcker was outvoted. There was the mutiny in the echoes. Mutiny in the Fed. And there was a lot of talk, does that mean Paul Volcker should resign? I'm not saying he should have resigned at all. The view then was President Reagan did a few things in uh, Iran, Contra, in Nicaragua. Marines get killed. Very sad for all of us. But that, he, that doesn't mean that President Reagan should resign. He did not resign. In this case, I don't think uh, Chairman Volcker should have resigned because of that. But it is good to have the dissent and have that come out in public. Oh, absolutely. Why am I, as a taxpayer, paying for 12 voting members, but I'm really getting one person? Why don't the other 12, 11 person, why do I need them? So that's the second issue I mm -hmm. have with the way in which the Fed is being run. You know, when they started taking transcripts of, of Federal Reserve meetings in 1996, the, the governor stopped dissenting. Right. Literally, we've had three since 1996. Mark Olson was the last one under, under Greenspan, I think, in 2002. And they've, the, the board has become this, this, 
I, I have hopes, I will say it on the record, I have hopes for Christopher Waller because he is the first uh, board member that I've heard come out and actively uh, say that the Fed's policies are wrong. Right. I have a lot of hope. I'm very impressed with uh, Christopher Waller as well. Mm -hmm. He has dissented on a few occasions. He has already said that it, there is need to well, be... Well, he hasn't dissented yet, but I think he will. He will. But in talk, at least, no, I shouldn't use the word dissent, but mm -hmm. in his power, TV interviews, expressed his disagreements mm -hmm. or concerns about it. But here is the problem. The system is such that even if Mr. Waller were to disagree, it wouldn't mean very much. The majority will still be on the other side with the chairman. That's true, but I, I think, I mean, as a Fed watcher, I'm very excited for 2022 just because you've got one dove, two neutrals, and one hawk rotating off of the, and you've got four hawks coming in. One, two, three, four. I, I mean, it, in all the years, since Paul Volcker, I don't think you've seen a quintuple dissent. And you could be talking about something of that magnitude given the change of characters in January. I'm just, I'm all, I'm excited. Right. No, no, I hope you are correct. I hope it happens. But it, it, you need to break through the system in mm -hmm. order to get that, situa that situation because history is not in favor of it. No, I know. Even 1986, by the end of the day, when Preston Martin had dissented with Paul Volcker, he pulled the vote and Volcker in turn was furiously working with the governments in West Germany, with France and in Great Britain to make sure that the German mark, uh, the French franc and the G British pound sterling would not go in a different direction and they would all reduce the discount rate or the equivalent rate together mm -hmm. in order to orchestrate it. He could not act by himself. So finally, there was no dissent, but, but ultimately, at least that's the first indication that you had that it could happen. And if you have that, as you said, with so many hawks going into 2022, that would be a positive. The question is, even before 2008, Daniel, you had people who were interviewed after the crisis uh, blew up and they were said, why didn't you do? And the answer often was, I could not disagree with Chairman Bernanke so openly, then why do I pay you a salary oh, if, absolutely. You, if you're not going to disagree with him and express your intelligent views in the process? I, I, I think there's very few, very little appreciation. There, there is a different structure of Federal Reserve District and there, there, there is a, a private ownership aspect of, of the district banks. But the members of the board, they're full government employees. Right, exactly. Paid by U.S. Paid by taxpayers. taxpayers. And they have an, there's this MIT mafia that kind of forms policy within the board and everybody just seems to go along. So again, uh, you know, I, I, there, there's my knock on wood for Christopher Waller, but I, I do hope we start to see, because I think you agree with me. Uh, I think that the, that the problem in housing in the United States has become extraordinary, extraordinarily problematic and that much of it lies with, with what's happening at the Federal Reserve and I don't think it's going to be transitory. I, I agree with you fully. I don't think the inflation is transitory at all. On the housing side, let's look at the inconsistency of policy, particularly with respect to housing. Um, Secret Secretary Yellen goes in public and she makes a statement She's very concerned about house prices increasing, especially because low and middle income first time buyers cannot afford to buy their first home. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Federal Reserve is spending $40 billion every month to buy mortgage backed securities, essentially pushing the yield down and making the mortgages cheaper. And if you already own a house, your house price is appreciating. And if I don't have a house and I'm coming to buy it for the first time, I am left high and dry. I, there's no yep. way I can compete with you. No. And plus, there's an army of investors who are taking advantage of the zero interest rate policy and coming in with cash, even though it's levered up to the hilt right. on Wall Street, but they're coming in with cash and pricing out these first time buyers as well. Exactly. And the, look at the here is the other issue, is just more, I think, statistical, measurement oriented. Uh, re, uh, house prices don't go in the consumer price index. No. Owner equivalent rent and rent does. Owner equivalent rent is 25% of the CPI. Owner equivalent rent plus rents, mm -hmm. which you pay as a rent, uh, as a lessee, 
together it's about one third of the total weight. So it's significant. But then you have had massive explosion, 16% annual increase in the home prices, and then it doesn't reflect on the CPI. And it's similar up. increases in rents. Right. So it's a, exactly. Now though, I think that's going to change. And that is, I think, a new warning for the Fed, again, on the housing side that you mentioned. What is this? I have been expecting the Supreme Court to turn down the Biden extension of the eviction ban. Mm -hmm. I think he did that in early August mm -hmm. and the president was able to get maybe 20 days out of it. And the Supreme Court last night said it cannot be done. Right. So what does it mean? The landlord is going to be able to evict the tenant. And once the eviction is done, the rent is going to go at a much higher pace for the new person who's coming in because the landlord can check your background, your ability to make your rent payment, and it's going to be higher. So I have said, I put out a tweet earlier today saying later in this year, expect the rent to show up more and more in the, in the consumer price index. Mm -hmm. What will the chairman Powell do? He'll probably say it's transitory. If you keep repeating that without but a basis... But he knows that that's not transitory. Supply chain disruptions, even if they go on for several years, starting with the trade war, but supply chain disruptions, you can make the argument that they will eventually be resolved and the containers will get into the right ports and that manufacturers will, will, will increase production and supply and demand curves will cross, blah, 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 blah. That's a, a lease is 12 months. I agree. A home price is, is a long term purchase. Right. So I don't think, th I, th I think he would lose. And if you note it with the Jackson Hole speech, there was not a word he spoke about housing, not one right. word. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. Very good point. And you know why it's a weak point? Why would I bring up as chairman of the Federal Reserve housing when he doesn't support my argument? Mm -hmm. Because he can say they are all supply bottlenecks, but he doesn't say anything about it. Delta variant is useful to his case. That's a new one and therefore we have to keep inflating the money supply. But the housing goes against it so you don't talk about it. Rents are going to increase so they are going to push up. In. That's not transitory but you don't talk about it. So if you ignore housing and rent you actually have a freer pass in terms of saying things will be okay. This is, this is the issue. And I, in fact, I replayed a few days ago uh, an old Woody Allen movie and where he's walking on the street and there is a car backing up and coming here to park. And so he stands, he's just a, a person, a pedestrian. And the car driver is coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And the car comes and then it hits this car behind it. And he said, that's okay. And then he walks off. <laughs> The Fed is never wrong. Mm -hmm. Whenever things happen, it is somebody else's fault. Right. Uh, Bernanke and his Fed did not foresee the 2008 crisis. They are considered heroes for what they did after. But you wouldn't have had to do any res rescue if you had anticipated it. A lot of people were thinking about how much of a problem it was. And well. Here we are in the 12th district where New Century and Countrywide Mortgage and all kinds of very obvious evidence that there was a subprime bubble and it's right in Janet Yellen's backyard. And she's Treasury Secretary today. I can't wrap my head around that. Precisely. That's an excellent view. That's, I completely subscribe to that. Go back to 2008 since we were talking about it. Jackson Hole 2005. Raghuram Rajan, who was a chief economist for the IMF at that time, mm -hmm. nobody has briefed him on this is going to be like a rah 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 for Alan Greenspan before he leaves the job. So he honestly talks in terms of it. I have read the speech several times. I, I, ha I, I have as well. It makes me very modest. It makes me say, here is somebody that just follow what happened. And again, a very famous economist sitting in the audience, whom we all know who it is, said this is, uh, he's a financial Luddite, doesn't understand a financial Luddite. technology. <clears throat> and so he turned out to be correct and it almost came word to word in terms of how, what he anticipated. Except nobody can predict the time. He's speaking in August 2005, the thing started to fall apart in 2007 and essentially collapsed by September 2008. 
that's fine. You, you can't predict it. But I'm saying the Fed did not take any responsibility for it. Look again at the Fed today. You have people, when they are talking about the, the succession, Powell is very, uh, again, uh, liked in Congress. His congressional support is very good, in addition to support from Janet Yellen. He practically lives on the Hill. He's yeah. had so many meetings. Yeah, right. very political, politically savvy player. Exactly. And people say, why is it, what do you like about it? He comes here often and he makes speeches to us. That has nothing to do with monetary policy, how mm -hmm. impressive you are to talk to and how nice you are when you make a presentation. So what are they talking about? They, it has become very clear, and again, this goes to the crux of why the Fed is not independent. The only candidate who was talked about as a possible replacement for Powell is Lyle Brainerd in, the, in recent uh, weeks. Not very strongly, but at least anybody she, mentioned. She, yep. But what do they say? That both of them agree on continuing the quantitative easing. Both of them agree on bond purchases because it's very popular with Congress too. Where does she differ from Chairman Powell? In terms of regulation. Mm -hmm. Some people in Congress think he's too light on regulation. She wants more regulation. Uh, I think I would prefer her because I like regulation or I prefer him because I like quantitative easing. But she dared not go and speak against the bond purchase if she has a chance of continuing. And now it's mentioned she'll become the vice chairman in the new setup. And so all of that makes... She gets the head of regulation, Warren is placated, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren is placated, everybody's yeah. happy. Everybody is happy, except the economy will pay a price. Right. And whether it will be in six months or over the next two years, that's what is not clear. No, I think you're right. Um, but I, ha I will have to say, and I'd love for your, you know, the, the, the fastest... Uh, recession that we had prior to this was in I think 1980 and it was six months right. in duration and this one was two months which isn't even technically a recession it really feels like we had a bump along the way and then you have 43.2 percent of GDP injected into the economy with fiscal right. stimulus as well as what the Federal Reserve is doing do you think there's a chance that that the the compre that, that, that time has been compressed in a post-pandemic world, especially if there's nothing coming on, on the fiscal side. And I mean, when I say the fiscal side, I mean checks in people, people's pockets. Um, first of all, in terms of the definition of a recession by the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the final arbiter of mm -hmm. the date when it began and the date when the recession ended, um, even though we use two quarters of negative GDP, that's not really the definition. It is mm -hmm. a comprehensive downward movement of various sectors within yes. the economy. So when you take that into account, um, last year probably qualifies as a recession because it was not too long, as you said, but at least it was comprehensive. Everybody went down and I was looking at the net, uh, the NFP, the job creation number. We lost about 20 million jobs, jobs in yes. a single month, February of 2020. Yes. yes. So in that sense, it qualifies as being a recession. Your question was, is the time, live, time reduced? I think this was reduced because they just threw everything, including the kitchen, mm -hmm. into the ki uh, kitchen sink, so to say, the monetary policy, fiscal policy in numbers, which, were, which make the 2008-2009 rescue look like child play compared with what True. we did. Therefore, we came out of it very, very fast. And I have a basic principle. If you, now that both of us are in Santa Monica, if you go and you take $100,000 worth of $100 bills right outside in the small area and you distribute it from a helicopter and let it fall, the GDP of Santa Monica would have increased immediately by $100,000. Yes. By definition. Of course. That is the statistics. And as people pick up the $100 bills and they spend it, there will be more a multiplied effect. That doesn't mean Santa Monica will generate more employment for the next five years. That is what has happened with the fiscal and monetary stimulus. Mm -hmm. You have done something to get you out of the rut immediately. And I have been a big fan of structural reforms. I watched Germany in 2003-2005 yes. with Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder. 
and then allowing the fact that you as a worker who do not have skills which are in demand if you would take a cut in your pay the government will subsidize your education to become a welder or a carpenter for which there is uh, there is demand right the welder or carpenter the person who runs the firm wants to hire you because you're cheap the government is subsidizing a year passes by when you're an apprentice now you're skilled mm -hmm. the employer doesn't want to let go of you and that's what happened in bringing the german unemployment rate down not because they ran a huge fiscal deficit or the german uh, there was no bundesbank by then you had the european central bank which was uh, providing all the cash in order to do that but they empowered they re-empowered they re-skilled their workforce exactly and we've done apps we, we've done the opposite done we've the opposite. encouraged people to stay out of the workforce and now they have serious skills atrophy and we're and, and, and there's concern going forward that we're not going to have the right workers for the right positions this has been 19 months of a wasted opportunity absolutely correct that is that is to me is the big issue if you look at the 1.9 trillion in the in the Biden stimulus plan or even if you look more at the 3.5 or 3.7 trillion more that the house passed um, you are looking at very little that is talked about in terms of worker training mm -mm. and any established means of growing your skill productivity Instead, it's a case of let's pour more cash into it and that will create growth, but it will not sustain no. it. No, that's just, that's, that, that, that is the traditional definition of pork, right. so to speak. Um, and and, and, and you, so this, this is why I'm curious and, and I'm, I'm looking at the 1980 episode of this very quick recession and then we went back into recession. That ended up being a double dip recession. Right. And again, we're looking at the potential for a parallel because there hasn't, we haven't done anything productive in the aftermath of this two-month crash in economic output, productivity, workers lost. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what is going to be a lot. Most of the sell-side economists seem to think that the economy is just going to continue propelling itself along. But very few can explain how right. this is going to happen. I think you're spot on. Here is the issue. Um, you have recovered. The recession of 2020 was a short one. We have recovered. But inflation, in my mind, is going to be sustained and stay high. And if that happens to be the case, and people say to me, why am I talking about stagflation? It happened in 1979 because the oil was a very essential commodity. There was no substitute for it, and it went up so much in price. Mm -hmm. My answer is you have so many commodities now in short supply, not one, but several. Yep. And pouring cash is not going to make those commodities increase in the amount that are available to you. So the chances for a stagflation is if you look at it in a Keynesian sense, it's aggregate demand and how much you're boosting. And all of the unemployment compensation and paying people to stay unemployed means that they have adequate amount of money in terms of personal consumption. Today's consumption numbers showed a very healthy increase. It is continuing to take place. And I think on top of that, you have all the government spending that is taking place. That will keep the growth high for some time. Mm -hmm. But then inflation is not going to come down in a meaningful manner. At some point in time, the, the investors will take notice and again, Chairman Powell saying that inflation is transitory may make less and less sense. Again, I come back to my favorite team of Fed Independence. If he has been nominated by September and then he goes, it's probably less of a consequence personally thereafter. And that's the cost that we'll all have to pay. That's right. And there's also the other elephant in the room and, and most people discount it, but I, I think that we should be at least cognizant of the 2011 episode with the debt ceiling and how very far politicians were willing to push the finances of the country in the name of, of, of trying to ensure that they got their political pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. And we have these midterms coming up and, and, and the country is running low on money pretty quickly. We're burning through money quicker than we expect it to right. because of what's going on in Afghanistan as well. 
So, and again, we have Janet Yellen running the Treasury Department. So I, I, I think that that cannot also be discounted because the Federal Reserve will never get in the, in the middle of a political battlefield. They will always step right, back from, 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 some, from something like that. So that could even push your policy error further. Even further. You are right. I, there's absolutely, there's nothing I can disagree on that point. Right now, you have the um, uh, extension of EC policy due to the Fed renomination. Mm -hmm. Going into 2022, you're talking about, then you're already in an election year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm staying away from Afghanistan because so far, the impact is not clear. But however, if the conflict increases and the defense spending has to increase for the United States, which we have not factored in, we are right. only talking about fiscal stimulus for the unemployed and so on, then you're going to add more to spending and more uh, borrowing that is going to take place. All of that, this was something I feared. And for four years, I had been a dove on the 10 year yield and going against consensus in saying 10 year yield is going to go down. And oftentimes this is from 2017, 2018 through into early 2021. Mm -hmm. I abruptly changed on January 5th when the two Georgia Senate elections right. went over to the Democrats. Now they have all branches of government. And what, mm -hmm. uh, what has happened since makes me very frightened. I haven't changed my view. I now think that interest rates are due to increase. And if you add on top of it defense expenditure related to Afghanistan, you're going to put even more pressure on the treasury yield mm -hmm. than has happened so far. Well, we are definitely at a, a very tenuous juncture. With, with that in mind, where do you feel the dollar is going to be in 10 or 20 years? Uh, I'll give you an answer. I'll answer your question and also give you an answer over two years and then 20 years. Over two years, there is no substitute for the dollar. It's not the Chinese renminbi. There are still a lot of foreign exchange and capital controls the Chinese have. Mm -hmm. And so it's not freely, freely tradable. So that's not going to happen. And the euro is not going to take its place as easily either. Uh, Japanese yen, I think, is in decline. So you can't uh, go there to get a break. So the dollar is no competition. And that's why I think the DXY, the dollar index, after being at 90, 91, in the last few weeks have gone, gone, has gone up to 93, mm -hmm. uh, because they are saying the Fed at least is thinking of tapering. And the ECB is, the European Central Bank is not. The Bank of Japan is definitely not going to do anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the dollar remains strong and there is no alternative to the dollar. So it's going to hang around on the DXY side between say 91 and 95 range for the next couple of years. Over the next 20 years, um, I go to Europe often, that is at least pre-COVID, used to visit regularly. And I am impressed with their coming together to form a 750 billion euro common euro bond, mm -hmm. which would be the obligation. I wrote a piece saying, that this is the equivalent of an Alexander Hamiltonian movement for the United States when in 1789 he had 13 colonies, 13 states to deal with. You had profligate Massachusetts and you had conservative Virginia and you had to make both of them agree to have even Massachusetts debt be taken on by all 13 states rather than by one state and he succeeded. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the federal debt issuance. I never thought the Europeans would do it in my lifetime. Bob Mundell used to talk about European integration and what was happening there. This is taking place with these, uh, the issuance of the 750 billion euro bond. Not only that, just like at that in 1789, you had to give more money to Massachusetts and Virginia was the contributor. Mm -hmm. Now, Germany, Netherlands, Austria, the creditor countries are the contributors. The entity benefiting the most are going to be Italy and Spain. Italy is going to get about 100, 192 billion euros out of the 750. So the others are agreeing to it. Why am I saying all this? Mm -hmm. If that is a further step in European integration, and as a result of the COVID situation, 
and I'm impressed with what Mario Draghi has been able to achieve in Italy. If he is able to get structural reforms passed in Italy and therefore that forces even Spain and Greece mm -hmm. to make the changes, especially on the labor side, because the labor market is completely inflexible in very many of these countries. You can't be fired. And if you are in your uh, mid to late 50s, you are well settled in your job uh, that you're not, you can't be replaced, which means the youth unemployment is very high because unless you leave, they can't get your job. Right. That is in the process of changing. They are allowing more people to be hired on a contract basis. So put together the integration that is coming on the monetary side. Add on top of it structural reforms and the likelihood. And you asked me to look at 20 years ahead. Mm -hmm. I am. 20 years ahead, let's say that Europe is a much more integrated place and you also have more of these structural reforms being uh, implemented, then you can have Euro become a credible competitor to the dollar. Or the Chinese may open up their currency and they can uh, do that. In a sense, it, those would be disciplining devices for the Federal Reserve and for the Treasury. You can't get away with doing what you're doing right, right now. You know, I, you've opened my eyes to the to the potential for Europe because people always talk about that as as being an impossibility to bring the Italians and the Sp the Spaniards and the French, but there's certainly an economic motive. Right. Certainly an economic motive. Um, before we uh, before we end this, I'm uh, I, I need to congratulate you. You've got a granddaughter. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. We are very happy. The family situation is great, and I'm leaving soon to go see my granddaughter yet again. Well, good. Um, let's pick up this conversation again. Hopefully we can do it in New York next time. That would be fun. Wonderful. Bring that city back to life. Excellent. Um, I look forward to it. I really enjoyed your conversation. Your questions, I think, were right on the mark, very timely, and I appreciate being a part of it. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, I hope you're as enlightened as I am. Uh, in the event that, uh, that you enjoyed this discussion, I certainly did. Sri is a beautiful thinker. Uh, be sure and go back and catch uh, an earlier Down the Middle episode with Leland Miller of the, beige, of the China Beige Book. And he can add a little bit to uh, the China side of the analysis. And, uh, and if you haven't, please do subscribe. I look forward to the next time of Down the Middle with DiMartino Booth. Thank you. <laughs>